It's my pleasure to introduce tonight's moderator. Uh, his films include Following, Memento, in <laughs> Insomnia, Batman Begins, The Dark Knight, The Dark Knight Rises, Inception, and Interstellar, including the future Dunkirk. Please welcome Christopher Nolan. Thank you, thank you, but save it, save it, save it, because you're going to need it. Because uh, I have some very special people here, we have some very special people here to talk with about that amazing film. When Heat came out in 1995, I was living in England, and uh, this is back in the days when people actually read reviews and didn't just look at the score online. And I read a review that pointed out that it was a new American classic. I wish I could remember the reviewer, I would credit him with prescience, uh, and they said they couldn't wait to see it a second time. And I've been looking at the film superficially and thinking, great people involved with it, but it's cops and it's robbers. Is there more to be said about that? Uh, this review made me go immediately to see it, the day it opened. Uh, and I went back the next day to see it a second time because the film, as you've just experienced in this, this rare privilege of seeing it on the big screen, is, was a new American masterpiece. Now it's just an American masterpiece. Uh, and quite an incredible piece of work that I've drawn inspiration from and, and filmmakers of my generation have drawn inspiration from in the years since it was released. Um, but it's late and there's lots of people to talk to, so I want to go ahead and, and introduce uh, my first three guests. We're going to talk for a bit before we bring out some more people who are involved in this film. But uh, please, a very warm welcome for three people that I'm not going to bother to try and list their credits because they've achieved far more than I have, and far more than uh, anyone is, is going to want to sit here and listen to. You all know their achievements. The important thing to say is that these are three of the most important and iconic presences in American pop culture uh, over the last 50 years, and, and indeed in the, in the history of movies. So please join me in welcoming Al Pacino, Robert De Niro, and Michael Mann. So where to start? I mean, Michael, in, in my introduction, I was alluding to what I consider to be the greatness of the film in that it transcends genre. It's not a cops and robbers film. It's not a crime film. Uh, even though I would imagine the script on the page, you know, it, it, it pays attention to certain genre considerations, so much of the structure of the film departs from the norms. Yeah. Uh, so much of the audience's uh, sympathy is divided across what are antagonistic characters without being antagonist and protagonist. Um, for you, in your writing process, is that underpinnings, the philosophical underpinnings of the film, the things that give us lots to talk about this long after you've first seen the film, um, are they there when you're first writing? Do they come in more through the production process? They came in, no, they came in, absolutely came in in the writing. It took, a, it took a while to write it because the, the original idea um, was a uh, something that a guy named Charlie Adamson, who was a friend of mine who killed a real Neil McCauley in a shootout in Chicago in 1963. And it was his appreciation of his enthusiasm for Neil McCauley and uh, his admiration for him. And Charlie was very much a hunter as detective, and they, the scene in the coffee shop, it actually happened. See, they, they met each other, they almost got in a shootout in the parking lot, and Charlie stopped buying a cup of coffee, and it was in the Belden Deli in Chicago. And the reason that they came together, and but the, the oh, those components of their personalities that were the same, the other components were very different, made it so that it was both true at one and the same time that they were that they had the kind of intimacy that only strangers could have. And at the same time, uh, uh, Charlie wouldn't hesitate to blow Neil out of his socks, which he eventually did. Um, the camp out, so it, it was one of those things where the contrapuntal nature of it really fascinated me, that both are true, it wasn't a contradiction. 
And so that's the real uh, kind of germ of the film. And then I, for me, it never really was a genre, exercise in genre. It was always, there's these people, they're dimensional from my own experience with, with, um, you know, with convicts, with, with professional thieves. They're people, they have families, they have mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers. And, the, uh, and so it was the, the appeal of really digging into the dimensional life of all the characters um, and, and their outcomes that, was, uh, that fascinated me. Yeah, I mean, it's rare to see a film that is so long and epic, but every character is efficiently drawn. Every character has this life off screen. Um, I've got a question for, for both Al and, and Bob. And Al, we've worked together before. Yes. That has nothing to do with the question. I just want to say it because I'm very proud of it. <laughs> but uh, glad it's come back to you. <laughs> <laughs> In taking on these characters, uh, I mean, you you two are both uh, actors with extraordinary commitment to the truth of a performance and the interior life of a character being expressed in sincere terms. In the case of this film, these characters also have an iconic presence, and they're part of a grand visual design that's going on. And I was curious to ask both of you, in, in how do you balance in your process the sincerity of the interior process with the, the understanding of the iconic nature of the character? <laughs> you first. <laughs> I'm ready. I've worked with him before, so I think I can answer this. <laughs> and it was a great experience, I might, might add. Um, I think I get it, what you're, you're, you're at. And, and I, I think one of the things that at least I tried, having seen Bob and known him my whole life, and, and um, admired him, my, and so it, at the onset, I thought, I don't know if I mentioned it to Michael, but I thought there should be that difference in, in, in the characters in terms of their, uh, how they come off, how they're, you know, what colors they're, they're in. And I thought that, uh, you know, the more introverted or extroverted, I thought that would help with a balance uh, so, so we had talked about it, I think, Michael. I, I mean, you yeah. help me at all here. <laughs> but the, that, was, that was part of it. And I, and I think I, I took a liberty. We did both. We had talked about it. I know that I, my character's uh, um, situation is different than his. Uh, and... and I, I, my life is falling apart, and his is just starting. And 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 uh, that was a key for me, anyway. And I, and also the car. I don't know if this has gotten out much. I don't know if I've ever said it. But I, I might be breaking the law now, but I'll say it. Um, the character I played is is a guy. He's a, he's been around. He's done a lot of stuff, and he also. Uh, chips cocaine and I, I always thought that that was a um, a choice we made and and but yet not not showing it because it would be somewhat uh, um, it was a little it would, it would attract too much attention huh it would attract too much attention. yeah but there is a scene in it where it goes by really quick but which we never get never got into the film and I've always wanted to say uh, sometimes, <laughs> just so you know where some of the behavior's coming from. <laughs> okay? Mm -hmm. I never thought I'd ever have that opportunity to say this, <laughs> this you know, elegant audience here that I could actually, um, anyway, I've had to say it for 20 years and I, I <laughs> thanks for this opportunity, Mike. Oh, you're welcome, Al. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Now, what, how it answers your question, it's kind of vague and around and around, but it sort of does in a way. Yeah. No, it, it absolutely does. <laughs> now, Mr. De Niro. Yeah. <laughs> what was the question again? Fair point. 
I what I would, say anything. Yeah. Say, say yeah. anything. No, what I what I wanted to know about is is Neil. He's a very iconic figure in the design of the film, and yet he's played with total sincerity as a as a psychologically realistic character. And there are all there are all kinds of uh, nuances to it that I'm curious about. And maybe it's too intimate a question in terms of your process, but. For example, I mean, he has an extraordinary, extraordinarily acute perception of the world and of what's going around him, and yet at times an unbelievable blind spot, particularly in his relationship with Edie, you know, when he strolls casually in and, you know, is drinking his drink and thinking about everything that's going on and expects her to just come, come with him. Um, and I'm sort of curious as to the, how you approach that psychology, those blind spots, with somebody who's that, that sharp. Well, you know, Michael wrote the script, <clears throat> and the thing that, <laughs> about and the characters, the thing about Michael is that he's, he creates a tension in the, uh, in the whole approach of the film, even in, the pra in our training and everything. It's a whole kind of, it just, uh, it kind of affects you where you know every moment is, I don't want to say precious, but kind of important. Uh, so the, the things that, like the, what you're talking about, and I'm not, I, I can't think specifically, but all I know is that whatever he does, it just makes the move, whatever he did was uh, important and um, creates a tension, if you will, or a tautness. Um, uh, what else could I, could I say? Say, what what, what yeah. we all did together, the three of us did together, and everybody, and Val, and 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 uh, uh, Ashley Judd, and Amy Brenneman, and Diane Venora, everybody, and uh, uh, John Voight, was we spent a lot of time building their histories. So what the film is 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 the right now of it. Mm. What what preceded that was very specific, very detailed history that we really immersed. We really immersed ourselves in why and how Hannah is a hunter, why he truly is, and he's somebody who is all I am is who I'm going after, and why and how he is completely self aware. There's no self deception. And the only other person who is as conscious and unself aware in the movie is Neil McCauley. And what was Neil McCauley doing when his father disappeared and he and his brother got remanded and they wound up in. Um, Gladiator Academies like Tracy or Chino, and he lost track of his father, lost track of his brother, and then graduated into crime. And at what point this very bright guy decided, I have to figure out, which is something observed with convicts in, uh, uh, who are in penitentiaries, and uh, particularly Folsom, particularly in the 70s, by the way, when they had a lot more programs in the institutions, and they would literally go into guys with third or fourth grade education would walk into libraries and say, give me a book that tells me about time. Okay? tells me about my life. I got to figure out what I'm going to do or I'm just going to say, hello, Gray Walls, my life is yours and surrender to a life in prison. And instead of that, people like Neil McCauley, and this was part of the backstory, and this is part of the backstory of Neil McCauley, people like Neil McCauley find out what they think time is, that time is short and it has to be invested. And if you don't invest in it and have experience, it's your fault and it's not going to happen. And then they continue to read, and they could read Marx and decide that property is theft, and that becomes a justification for stealing, or, or they get into Buddhism, and they decide that if anything happens to all the other people, that's, they're, they're working out their bad karma. What all the, so there's some of the philosophical underpinnings that is factual and part of the backstory of who Neil McCauley is when he gets out, and Technicolor is going to be New Zealand or Fiji. And all is a way station on the way to somewhere else. And then how does he minimize risk by being anonymous? And so it's a gray suit and a white shirt, so it's hard to describe him. And no attachments so that people can't, the cops can't cut into his communications and talk to people like Edie. So it's not supposed to be an Edie. Once there is an Edie in, in his life, it's supposed to be temporary. And that's why he's not going back. But then he's succumbs to the seduction and calls her and um, does go back with her. But, you but know. is that the fatalism of the film? I mean, we're talking about uh, outcomes. Uh, you're talking about each character. Yeah. Is their fate, I suppose, is a byproduct of them violating their code at some right. point. Um, there's huge fatalism to the film. I mean, I, watching it again, 
uh, tonight, it, it occurs to me that it's as, in some ways, it's as bleak as any Samuel Beckett play, in that there's no chance these guys are, this guy in particular, <laughs> there's no chance he's getting out of this city, of this, you know, and, and John Voigt's character seems the sort of gatekeeper somehow, and you feel uh, that they're very imprisoned somehow in this, this urban environment. I mean, it, almost in the tradition of sort of like a modernist Edward Hopper's Nighthawks or something, or um, right. Blade Runner, or uh, Greed, von Stroheim's film, you know, these, these sort of stories where characters are, are trapped by their fate, really. The, the way fate works was just something we just invented, which is that, well, what happened to each character is a function of the way he thinks life works. Mm. So it's char totally character-driven. And, and Neil, believing that um, being very doctrinaire and not having attachments, uh, and that's a very efficient and effective navigation system through the way station, if he deviates from that, which he does, on the, on the Palisades when he's talking, talking to Edie. He, if he deviates from that, then there has to be a repercussion and cause and effect will be brutal. Mm. So the Neil who is flying free and is, and is uh, moved by emotions like vengeance or rage or deciding to go after Wangro, the Neil from the beginning of the movie wouldn't have gone, would never have gone after Wangro. Mm. So that's the, when, whereas another character like Val Kilmer, who's kind of postmodern and doesn't have doctrine, doesn't have discipline, he skates. Mm. So what happened to them, their fate was a function of who they were as characters in the engine of the story and the way it drives to the end. So for all three of you, um, I mean, one of, one of the great and memorable scenes in the film, there are, there are many, but, but the iconic coffee shop uh, meeting that, that people were so struck by when the film came out, seeing two such great actors who had not acted in the same scene together before, together. Um, there was such mythology around at the time. I remember several friends of mine being convinced that you shot it on different days because there was no two shot. Uh, <laughs> and when I, when I finally moved, moved to LA and went to Cape Mandolini's where he shot at, I was pleased to see there is a two shot. It was above the door of Cape Mandolini's, it's right. still from the film. Um, but uh, I, I'd love to hear, I'm sure people here would love to hear about shooting that scene. Um, was it single camera? Was it two cameras? Did you have two cameras so you could shoot both close ups at the same time? How did, how did you approach that, that momentous event? It, it started with, with you know, this consummate um, respect and uh, for the great artists that these two guys are. And uh, we didn't, we talked about the scene and we analyzed the scene. We kind of read the, uh, kind of read it off the page a little bit. We didn't want to do the scene mm. until we were at Cape Mandolini's. And then the, uh, it was so ingrained that, that I knew that the, in all little tiny organic details, it would be different from take to take. Mm -hmm. So what I wanted to do was shoot with two cameras, two over the shoulders, and then I also had a, sec a third camera that was shooting a profile that I never, we never cut into the film. Mm -hmm. And um, so, so I knew that there'd be an organic unity to one take, and there'd be a slightly different organic unity to another, because if you look at it very carefully, if Bob shifts his hand like this a little bit, right in the middle of dialogue, Al is doing something to counter it because maybe he's shifting his positions that he can get closer to a weapon. And it was just this back and forth. So most of the, most of the scene is all take 11. Take 11. Yeah. Take 11? It's, I know, it's, it's <laughs> sick that 20 years later I actually remember his take 11. <laughs> all I remember is that he wanted to Michael shot one way, and, and then all of a sudden said, should we turn around and go this way? And I said, wait a minute, we just shot like one take, possibly two this way, and then it was like, oh, God, it was. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> and because it, it, I thought you were going to say you were remembering take 18 and no, 19. No, and... No, <laughs> uh, what do you remember about that, that shoot? Uh, I do remember that uh, Bob said, uh, I thought, really, at first I wondered about it, and then I thought how right he is, because he said, let's not rehearse it. Mm. So Because you that love to rehearse. A, oh, yeah. You love to rehearse. <laughs> and so does Bob does, too. Right? No, I, I, I do two at times, but this kind of, this scene, we, yeah. do as, uh, we didn't have to. No, we, but the, the thing is, uh, 
What, what Bob said is so true about rehearsal, I think. If there's any actors out there, it's one of the things I really admire and I follow, and that is that there is no sense in rehearsing if the people around you and you and everything don't know how to rehearse. Mm. That, is, that is an important factor. Might as well not rehearse or rehearse very little. But it's true, you know, because it's a certain kind of thing and people either respond to it or they don't. And so and they could be great actors, of course, but they don't want to rehearse. Mm. I've, I've had experiences like that. And Bob, though, did this particularly, I think, for this the nature of this film. Well, it was also that we were stationary, so it wasn't we had to sort of rehearse blocking or anything and discover how our physical moves would yeah, be. We right. were kind of... St- there, though there were subtle moves in the scene itself, obviously, but anyway. And we started late, and <laughs> we, we started late, and Michael, you know, we were her, we, we her, went through it, kind of blocked it, but didn't block it the way I remember it, maybe I don't remember it correctly. But we didn't start till after lunch or dinner, which was really like one o'clock in the morning. So, and this was like, I love the scene, and I, uh, wanted you know was really wanted to be as best as it could be so i was a little unhappy that we started so late in the middle of the night but anyway we did and it was fine you know it was actually actually intentional to just kind of i know he wanted to (laughs) tire us out going into a scene like that that you know is going to be such a significant part of the film huge expectation from both of you as you sit down to perform it at the end of that night Did you know you had it? Did you feel it? I never knew that. I never know. I I, I, I knew we we had it. All I know is you knew. That's your job. (laughs) (laughs) By the way, we we rehearsed. I'd like to do it again. (laughs) I'm going to reshoot it. We we normally would rehearse scenes. That scene we talked about, we all, this group decided, you know, we want to just talk it through and to save it for the you know, for the event of shooting it, which was the only scene we probably did that with. But mm-hmm. I, I tend to not want to rehearse things to the point where I feel like I, I wish I'd shot it. That's a, that's a disaster. I right. always want to take it, I always want to stop well short of, because I think things will be perfect once, and they'll, they'll never be perfect. You know, they'll never be 100% twice. They'll only be 100% once, and you want that happening in front of the camera. So do you substitute physical rehearsal of, of physical details for that process, in a sense? Because there's so much compelling physical detail in the film. Uh, one of my favorite parts being when the, the money goes into the bags and they slash the plastic and then smash the bag to loosen them. You know, there are so many things like that through the film that would have taken quite a lot of research, quite a lot of training. I don't know where you find those details from. Please tell me, because I'd like some in my films. But <laughs> <laughs> I get them from your film. You just got to get next to, <laughs> you just gotta get next to the real people. But uh, you know, we we trained for months yeah. in in everything for the shootout particularly the shootout, but also also uh, going into a bank which we did mm-hmm. in Century City, and without anybody except the security officer at the bank knowing that Val and Sizemore and Bob were going into the bank to scope out where the cameras were and they were supposed to come out of the bank and give us a detailed plan about how to hold up this bank. This See a, a lot of people going, bank. why the fuck is Robert De Niro casing my <laughs> bank? <laughs> well, or if, we had, we, had, we had plans. We ran short of the budget. We had other ways to finance his pictures. <laughs> uh, once again, on the physicality, I mean, Al, your character has an extraordinary way of moving. There's, there's an incredible energy to the movements when he gets out of a car and walks mm-hmm. to a crime scene. That wonderful moment where he skips down the stairs out of the hospital. Um, because you approach things very psychologically, very much from the inside. At what point does movement come into it? Well, I, I, since I've trained in the theater, and I, that's my, my first uh, um, exposure to acting and this from the theater, which is, you know, you're always using your body uh, language. And with this character, I think Michael helped me a great deal because he put me in this car, you know, what is it, a Porsche? No, Ford Fairlane. Oh, Ford Fairlane. Okay. <laughs> I don't know cars much, you know. But he... Uh, he you know, don't know much about He it. really knows them, you know. He's a... <laughs> and, and he knows his cars. And, and he put me in this car and he said, you know, 
your character just goes. I mean, it's speed. So every time in that car, it's very effective because that sort of is a, a kind of a, a microcosm of who this person is. He's, he get the, he gets turned on by his own speed and that kind of adrenaline. And uh, I think that produces things in your body, I think. And I guess it's responsible for the movement, but I didn't sort of plan it out. Mm. Well, yeah, we, we also did interrogations. We, uh, we staged interrogation, nothing to do with the screenplay, none, none of the text in the screenplay, in which, in which Al and the other detectives interrogated John Santucci, who's a, who, was a, who was a professional thief, and some other people, and, Ch and Charlie Adamson. And the, um, so we did a lot of work like that. And so how Al's character handles informants, which is to disorientate them, that's what he's doing with Ricky Harris in the chop yeah. shop. Mm -hmm comes from that, where you're constantly throwing different things at it to keep the informant totally on edge, because otherwise he'll lie to you because all informants yeah. lie to some of the time or all the time. It's coming so back to me now. I, I remember that now. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway. um, there are some more uh, people we'd like to, to bring out at this point. Um, I don't know whether I was told the voice of God would announce them. I don't know who the voice of God is. Whether such a person exists, I guess I am the voice of God. Uh, <laughs> Please welcome to the stage ah. actor Amy Brenneman. <laughs> Executive producer Peter Jan Brugge. Editor William Goldenberg. Actor Val Kilmer. Producer Art Lenson. Re recording mixer Andy Nelson. Cinematographer Dante Spinotti. Actor Diane Venora. And actor Michael T. Williamson. So obviously with, uh, obviously with so many people uh, up here, um, I don't want to go through person by person, you know, throwing, throwing questions to each individual. So let's make it a discussion. And as things occur to people, that something uh, you want to talk about, uh, feel free to, free to jump in. Um, I, Amy, let me start with you. Your character. Uh, I'm curious as to the, the sense of damage that the character has. Someone is very lonely. Loneliness almost referred to in the film as if it's a disease or a condition, something that Bob's character immediately denies having alone but not lonely. Uh, is that something that was just inherently in the, the script for you? Because I think in the performance there's a wonderful sense of that, that damage there. Yeah, I mean, I looked at the script. I thought she must be pretty fucked up. <laughs> Um, but I, one of, I will always remember a, a, a really important moment, um, it, truly, as an actor, where I, you know, had, had very much thought along those lines, and I thought, well, she's, you know, probably got a little damage, you know, got a little daddy stuff, got a little incest, got a little, I don't know, like, you know, um, why would she, you know, I mean, not that you're not fabulous. <laughs> I mean, at the beginning, you know. <laughs> um, but I remember saying to Michael, and Michael, that's the, the research thing. He said, "Just tell me everything you're thinking about." And I said some of these things, and and I will always remember this. And Michael looked right at me, and he said, uh, "No, she just falls in love with him." And it was really a beautiful moment. And you know, I thought. Um, you know, as most of us here, I was a huge fan of Last of the Mohicans, and I was like, well, anything this guy, it was a surrender and a sort of letting go into, um, into a romanticism and a mythic. And I thought, oh, I am, I am the aspirational hope, you know, of, of a person like Bob, and I'm a person in my own right, but I, I sort of let go of a certain psychological dissecting and really into the hands of, of the whole thing. And, um, and I also, yeah, it's funny watching that scene because, you know, one of the appeals about Edie is she's so unguarded. I mean, she's real, you know, and, and, and you sort of defend against that idea of loneliness. She's like, no, I can admit that, you know, people need connection. So um, I think that was probably how she was designed. 
she is, it's put perfectly, she is unguarded. Yeah, it's great, great performance. Val, I wanted to ask about your character's anger. Um, it's, it's an incredible performance, and it's one that I, I would imagine him being the younger member of the team uh, might on the page not quite see into that, that anger, because for me in the bank heist, when he takes the guy out, there's, a, there's a, a viciousness to it that we see one or two other places that seems buried and uncharacteristic, but it, it spikes through. Well, Senator, I have to apologize. I have a swollen tongue, um, so I hope you can understand me. Um, you know, I had so much fun, and uh, I was doing Batman at the time, and although that, that was a lot of fun and quite <laughs> strange, um, the most fun I, I had doing Batman was preparing to do it. Um, <laughs> on the weekends, we would go fire live ammunition, which I love to do. <laughs> and uh, we were way out in the valley. And the, uh, the experience of all the physical stuff, like Bob and I were saying earlier, and Michael was so um, dedicated to. Uh, well, I'll tell one story. We, you know, I hope this helps answer the question, but we were way into filming, and uh, Michael and I had talked to Roger, and they were actually about their history. And I love that. I love preparing and all that. But so we were filming now, and I had never had the opportunity because of my film schedule and the other film to go up to the prison that Michael had decided my character had come from. But I had to take off. So he said, I think we should go to the <laughs> prison, <laughs> which was in San Francisco, <laughs> which I did, <laughs> with Cruz Mano, and uh, we uh, missed our flight, and he wanted me to do a little pickup set in the afternoon, so, it has a written set, remember this? Mm -hmm. My producer, our producer. <laughs> um, but it has to fly us down on the set, down back to the set, even though we were, I think we were about two months into the filming. And he was so excited to hear what my impressions were of the prison, I was like built up memories and all. And uh, it, it was just a, a great tribute to his dedication and all of that uh, effort that gets then uh, put put down to the moment when we're filming was quite a quite exciting, and so I, I just had so much energy on the set. It was so much fun to be free, and the director has, and all the other actors have so much respect for what it really takes to make that moment as. Great as it could be. It's quite, quite a rare experience. Mm. I, I miss it. <laughs> oh, can you uh, speak to the genesis of the project? How did this come about? How did you and Michael cook this up? Well, Michael wrote a script. We were working actually on something else, and he said, which wasn't working out very well. And he said, you should take a look at this script. And I read it. I went, wow. <laughs> and he grabbed his belt buckle and went for the ride. So <laughs> it was yeah, we actually, we, it happened at the Broadway Deli. <laughs> and it happened <laughs> at the Broadway Deli, yeah. And uh, we, which, which, is, which is where Bob meets um, eating. Um, yeah, no, I mean, it was. I was considering not directing it. I was going to produce it. And that's my this original conversation. And I think you said to me, you're absolutely out of your mind. <laughs> was a... Yeah, particularly compared to the other thing we were working on. <laughs> right. Well... <laughs> <laughs> the uh, original script, you'd written it years before um, and actually filmed it as a TV pilot that 
didn't go that they showed on English TV um, some years ago, and it was a fascinating comparison because it's quite minor, obviously, compared to, to what it became. Um, and uh, when I asked you about it uh, previously, you said that the thing that had held you back from making the grander vision of it all these years was the ending. Uh, and I was curious if you could elaborate a bit on that, about where you had got to and where you, you'd stopped and what element of the ending yeah. Uh, came together. Yeah, the the the, uh, the, the pilot of the movie, the week's ninety seven minutes. This is you know two hours and forty five minutes. The the ending. Uh, once I found the ending, it which which is which which, which presented the challenge. That can I uh, make a drama in which the audience is a hundred percent invested in the outcome of Vincent Hanna? They want him to apprehend Neil Macaulay. At one and the same time, they're 100% invested, emotionally invested and empathetic to Neil Macaulay. They want him to get away but and hold both at exactly the same time. And we don't want the these two protagonists to vector to a collision because it's going to be fatal for one of them. At the same time, we thrill to it. So all of those kind of forces coming together in kind of a contrapuntal way, once I had figured that out, that then became the, the reason to do everything. And then I reverse engineered that into every part of the film, like what should be, what should precede that mm. moment exactly in the relationship between, say, say, Al and Diane Venora. Um, you know, is that that's the moment that he should say, all I am is who I'm going after, and it can't be anything like this, so that their realization so, uh, would set up again, yet again, you know, the kind of conclusion. The total open consciousness of both these characters. So everything yeah. should be generated by the ending. Well, Diane, for you, because the character you're playing, I think, extraordinarily difficult to pull off. I mean, there's a wonderful job with it because it's it's paradoxical because she's somebody who, in, in some ways, is not self-aware and is unaware of what's going on with her daughter at times and seems unaware of the nature of how the relationship is is playing out. And at other times, is able to articulate with real resonance who this guy is and what he's doing and what's going on on his head and how did you how did you juggle that how did you balance that i just played it fair enough i just played it um, yeah. and how was it to play with al did he behave himself just what example the way something is written michael wrote it so beautifully that there could be traps in it for me. So when Al came into the restaurant, you talked about his physical movement. Mm. We don't see this in the cut, but he came into the restaurant like like a like a dancer in a way, what kind of off balance. And I was so mesmerized by the, his entrance, which wasn't on film at the time, that I could see he was angry. So when he sat down, I thought it was a different kind of a scene, but there was such anger in him that in the moment, I remember just go underneath and just love him. So that's all I did. Well, it was wonderful. wonderful. <laughs> Michael, could you and Dante talk a little to the, the look of the film? And how you how you achieved it because the, the thing that I love about it is this it's stylish without being self-conscious it's it's sort of effortlessly timelessly beautiful uh, and in in the new uh, restoration that you've done uh, particularly I mean it, it it plays absolutely off today I mean it's it's very very restrained uh, but there's some extremely adventurous uh, techniques at play there that were very ahead of their time I think uh, in terms of some of the, the magic hour shooting, for example, and the city lights and uh, so forth. Can I say a little thing before? Please. I lose the memory. Um, I don't know if this movie needs to be any better or needed to be any better than what it is, but I have to say something provocative here from a technical standpoint. The movie is better because of the transition to digital uh, 4K technology. First of all, because... It has been done extremely well by Michael and uh, Stefan Sonnenfeld, the company three. But because the total control on colors and uh, information on the shadows that now you have or you don't, 
the whole final scene at the airport because you can make the faces softer and bring the moods down and reveal what's in the far background in a number of other situations uh, to me makes the film better. Uh, new technology. Well, for the record, they also made a great film print of it that they have here that looks fabulous too. For the record, I saw the, the print, print one, one month ago with Michael yeah. and uh, it's, it's not as good. <laughs> <laughs> You're not in the cave anymore. <laughs> I'm respectfully going to ignore that. The, <laughs> I, there are certain uh, scenes of the film where you're shooting at 22 frames, 20 frames perhaps even, that I've just sort of never seen that done in quite that way, you know, like when he enters the, uh, the house. Maybe, but I mean, if you see the finale of uh, Manhunter, it's a school book on uh, different frame rates yeah. for different situations. Yeah. Yeah. I think a very interesting thing that happened here is the scene between Amy Brenneman and Robert De Niro on the terrace that calls for this ocean of lights. Mm. And uh, in a very weird uh, situation, I proposed to Michael that we take a look at this new technology, which is the computer, mm. images put together with a computer, right? <laughs> and I went out, shot some tests, and the ability of uh, shooting the landscape at low frame rate. So, you know, uh, mm. raising the visibility even of the clouds in the sky, which are mm. a typical landmark, landmark in Los Angeles. They are lit from the orange light of the city. Uh, and then we shot the scene on the real location, mm. just putting a small green screen behind the actors. So the shot from behind is a slower frame rate to raise the exposure. Yeah, Good catch. It's all uh, done with. It's all done with. Uh, we're in, we were in the real location. Yeah, with it, you know, up above uh, Sunset Plaza, and you're looking out at the night, but you couldn't photograph it on film. You could in yeah. high def, which is why I did what I did in, in, in um, you know, in Collateral. Mm. So to to be able to see into the night the way you could, what we did is we put green screens up, blocking the actual view, shot the scene, and then took the green screens down, and then shot the background, but at three frames per second, so we could get exposure. Right. And cool. so that's so is a... Yeah, that's beautiful. Very cool. I mean, yeah, the way in which you capture the lights of the city and everything throughout the film is spectacular. I mean, the helicopter shots as well, passing everything, incredibly difficult to expose on helicopters flying like that. I mean, really amazing yeah, I think stuff. Michael had me fly on a third helicopter with a mag light <laughs> from which I was trying to light the other helicopters. <laughs> Believe it or not. And complaining all the time. But this is <laughs> There's not enough light. We should talk about the shootout because uh, it, it's an extraordinary piece of work. Uh, the thing that struck me seeing it on, on the big screen uh, with this incredible sound system as well um, is the, the sound of the guns. I mean, the, the reverb and the echo of those is, is I mean, they're like no other machine guns I've heard in, in movies, and you've heard millions of, of machine guns in movies. Are those production recordings of the downtown streets echoing? Was it done in post? I mean, how did you achieve that? Uh, those are basically production recordings. We had, we had an accelerated post, and so we had one of the most ambitious mixing schedules I've ever had where, where uh, Chris Jenkins was on one stage, they would work from about, I'd work there from about six o'clock in the morning till about two or three in the afternoon. And then Andy Nelson was across the street on another stage and their crew would start at about noon or one o'clock. And we would and, work till and, nine and, or 10 o'clock at night home. and we would do it. <laughs> we would. Okay. It was very long, yeah. But the, 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 the gunshots were, um, there was a, a it was, was so stunning, but I think Lee, Lee Orloff was, uh, was the sound machine, the production sound machine. The, the actual gunshots in those canyons of buildings and the way that the sound reverberated and echoed around the buildings was unique. And there were full load blanks, so they were high powered blanks. And it was frightening. You just stood there and it was just, it's a frightening sound. And um, so we had these really great production tracks. I had said that I really wanted to use those. Mostly when I got on the stage, I wound up with a, a, an elaborate set of cut sound effects, which we then dumped and went back to the, some of the production sound effects and yeah. mixed the two together. But the, the, 
The, the mix is that these guys did, and it, uh, it's, it, I, I think it's exquisite. I mean, it surrounds yeah. you, and it's there's, there's silences that make you focus visually into something happening in the center of the screen because of what the sound does. I mean, it's a real you know, brilliant mix that these guys did. It's, it's a fantastic mix. It's also got you know wonderful control of music as well. And the, the music, I have to ask you about the music because it's, it's so rare. There are so few filmmakers who are able to take such an eclectic group of composers and musicians and make it feel absolutely cohesive. So there's, I mean, you've got Brian Eno in there, you've got all kinds of ambient things, and then you've got Elliot Goldenthal's wonderful, very traditional classical sort of score coming in, but it all feels of a, of a piece. Is that, how did you go about sourcing all that? In, in the same way that this, well, it was the approach, and the approach was, was was all generated kind of from the end of the film, but the idea was that we are discreetly immersed into the lives of these characters and their lives and who they are as people make us feel certain ways and that's gonna determine their outcome. Then to kind of max out that polarity from character to character to character, whether it's Al or Bob or Breeden or Val or Sizemore, each one being different, uh, generate, though I wanted to generate in Dante's brilliant work in the film, a different lighting style, a different way of shooting certain scenes, and then it, it argued for very, an, an eclectic um, use of music, whether it's Moby or, or you know, Brian Eno or Kronos Quartet, and then Elliot Goldenthal's, Goldenthal's spectacular score. And, um, uh, and the commonality, which puts them together it's just, it's just the emotions of the story. But the idea of it being diverse and discreet was because everything was designed to focus towards the conclusion. Michael T, you have a wonderful part, wonderful supporting part that sort of <laughs> has many small moments of, of exactly what a supporting character needs to do in those moments. And then I think gets just this, this, this wonderful moment with Ashley Judd at the end where he outlines, you know, uh, her child's future and what that should mean to her as a mother. Um, I just want to say it was great, but I also wanted to know what what memories you had of getting to film that that particular scene and where that was done. I mean, the whole film seems to have been done almost entirely on location, entirely on location, I believe. Yeah. Um, where was that scene Venice. shot? That's Venice, Venice Beach. That's Venice Beach, yeah. okay. And what, what memories do you have of that? Well, I, 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 uh, I was really shocked that I got the job in the first place. <laughs> uh, that, true story. Uh, Michael, uh, I love Michael so much. I'd seen Michael in November. And then, like, February or March, I get this call from my manager that Michael and Al Pacino want to see you. And I was on the way to a... I was going fishing, man. I just picked up some... <laughs> see, true story. I just picked up some ghost shrimp, of all things, <laughs> to go fishing. <laughs> And <clears throat> sure enough, I go to Michael's office. I double back, go to Michael's office. And then I had the privilege of, within a half an hour, Al shows up. And, and the story I got from Al is, you got robbed. You didn't get a nomination for Forrest Gump. And they actually had another guy in the role. And Michael and Al got together, paid that guy off, and hired me. <laughs> because I didn't get a nomination. So I'm so grateful. <laughs> you know to those guys and um but the the way michael works it's it's my wife can tell you how much i love michael michael can walk up to an actor on a set and just before he would get to me he would look in my eyes and go you got it and i did i don't know how he put that shit in my head but he would do it <laughs> but he's but you know it was just a wonderful wonderful privilege uh, to work with uh, Al Pacino, Robert De Niro, just the whole everybody, Val, everybody's just a pure class act. I enjoyed working with Ashley. She listened very closely, and Michael would feed us story. He's so detailed. Oh, my God, it's amazing. But um, it was fun. I Did you get it. the backstories that, I mean, Michael, you were talking about these backstories you would create for all the actors. I mean, really, for any of the actors, were you were you actually writing these up and giving them to them, Michael? Oh, yeah. And do you still have them? Can we make a book? Oh, Michael's the master oh, yeah. of backstory. Believe me, he he 
can help you get there just like that. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And Michael, talk about the locations a little bit because it's an incredible epic and there's so much scope. It captures Los Angeles, a modern Los Angeles, in a way that I think no other film has to the extent. There's no nostalgia to it. It's, it's a very clear view of a modern Los Angeles. I mean, it extraordinarily, you know, begins with someone arriving on a train, which, you know, is not something you normally associate with L.A., but it has this feel of Los Angeles the whole way through as a playground, as a place to get lost in, as a sort of prison for these characters, so many different things. Um, the whole film was shot on location. You didn't build any sets. Did you build sets into locations, or was it just take it as you no, find it? No, if there was a set, I don't remember which one it was. The whole thing, we shot in 95 locations. So it was all, it was an wow. all location picture. And How I, many days for 95 locations? 107. Wow. So just moving but all who, the time. But who's all counting? <laughs> <laughs> and um, I had, I have, had, I had, and still have, you know, the best location manager on the planet, Janice Pauly, who's here someplace. <laughs> and, uh, and Lori Bolton. And it began with wanting to know Los Angeles, and I realized after having lived here for about 10 or 12 years at that time, or actually 20 years, that I didn't really know LA at all. We kind of, we kind of moved through a kind of a cultural self-imposed ghetto of the places that we go to in, 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 in our industry. And there's, I know that there's a lot more, a lot more out there. So I started uh, going out at night with uh, Tom Elfmont, who's also here. Um, who was a commander in LAPD, and we would go out about 9 o'clock at night on Friday and Saturday night and just answer random radio calls wherever they were all over the city. And we did this for about five or six months. And, and, um, that's, and we discovered the locations that are there as well as, as, well as uh, there's a lot of dramatic content. But, uh, and then Guzmano Cesaretti, who's also here, was with me on all, on all these various adventures that we had. Um, the strangest place we encountered is the Chop Shop, which was mm -hmm. in an unincorporated part of Wilmington that had, and that was a, um, there was, it was a pit bull fighting arena, an illegal abattoir, and something else. And that Vaquero, who's riding on horseback, who came through, he was from that. The guy who owned it was this albino guy who became the doorman at PJ's. And PJ's was a real place uh, for a while. I think it was in the basement of a Payless shoe store off, off La Brea. It was the after hours club. <laughs> um, we didn't shoot it there with it. So and we, it was just a real discovery of, of what Los Angeles, uh, what Los Angeles is. I mean, you're from Chicago, and the original inspiration for the film was a Chicago incident. You never thought about doing it in Chicago. Somehow, Los Angeles became, I mean, it's a character in the film. It seems like it's almost the driving force behind the film to sort of capture that urban environment. Yeah, it's, it's, for me, L.A. is more, is more transient. It's more surreal. It's, it's more balkanized in a great way and presents so many location so I mean it really becomes it's, it's a dramatic choice it's not it's, it's all based on the same kind of scene analysis that you know that I will work with with an actor or that we, that, that we would do in any of our rehearsals the same kind of scene analysis tells you know it helps me try to figure out what you know what, what the location should be so it's not by accident that Bob is driving from having um, uh, discovered Treo Mm. Uh, Danny Trejo and, and that betrayal and gets the information to go after Van Zant that he's driving through that the black refineries which are like you know diamonds in the night um, you know it's kind of a hellish landscape so you know you try to you try to try to find uh, try to find places that speak you know speak to you mm. well it's a masterful masterful job of it um, I just wanted to ask these two gentlemen any Final memories, uh, looking back after this this time. <laughs> <laughs> Says it all. I mean, I was happy to, to, more than happy to be part of the movie. And Michael, uh, you know, I knew it would be special when um, I read the script and met Michael. I just knew it would be special, and and um, so I'm happy that. It's gotten the attention it did. Mm. Oh, yeah, <clears throat> yes, me too. I, I, <laughs> I, 
I went along for the ride, you know. <laughs> it was New Year's Eve. I thought I'd go into something. But it, 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 the thing I remember a lot of things about it, they seem to be coming back to me <laughs> as I hear things. <laughs> but I, I remember I was doing my own movie at the time, remember? Yeah. And, and I was, because they would split it with Bob and it would go back and forth. And I found a place out here, you know, it was a fortuitous thing because it, it didn't belong. It was actually a Bosworth field in, in London that I was, I was uh, filming. But it was my movie. I was directing it and stuff. And was this Looking for Richard? Looking for Richard. And I didn't know what to do. I had some of the actors and, and uh, you know, Bob was taking all the time. And I had all this time on my hands. No, no, it's not true. It's just not true. But, 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 but Michael gave me a mini crew and, and, and people and machinery and stuff to go in this, uh, while I was off, in this uh, place in Simi Valley, actually, I used it there. And he gave me all these things. And I just went and, and I, 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 did I ever thank you for that? Michael? No, it's about time, My too. My God. <laughs> beautiful stuff. Just beautiful. It was so thrilling. And he gave me some of, you know, such great people to work with and stuff. So that was, that's a memory. But also doing the movie and, and being with these guys. It was great to see you again, Mr. T. Fantastic. And to see Val. Hi, Val. <laughs> and Diane, of course. And everybody, Amy. It, it's... You know, it's, I'm having this thing where I'm getting back there, you know. First half hour here, I just didn't know what these people were talking about. But now, it's starting to come back. And it's a great, it's a great, it's, it's good. I, Mike is great. He's just a great director, and so is uh, Chris here, so, and so is Robert, actually. I'm about to say, so am I, but no. No. I'm an actor. And I don't want to get in acting too much now. I, I like, but th this was great. It was a, it was a, the memory of it is is great. I, when I think of it, I I feel good. Yeah. When I see it, I feel good too. But uh, yeah. You know. The uh, the the experience of making it was was extraordinary yeah, well, because there was a uh, it was like a repertory company. Yeah. Uh, w you know, if, if if Val had a day off and. Bob, you know, Bob or Al were doing the scene. Val would show up to see how they were going to do their scene. It was very much, it was, it was really uh, kind of a community, and it was, uh, and it, it was so there was that sense about it, and uh, um, and then that carried through because I had uh, Warner Brothers asked me if um, if we could make a release by Christmas, and I said, well, I'll tell you after about six weeks of narrative ed of editing, if the story's in pretty good shape, then yeah, we can go for it. And I said, yes, we can. So then the editing room kind of became a kind of became a uh, an extension of the of, of the shoot because I won't get into all the boring detail about it, but the system we had required a vast number of uh, assistant editors to to conform what we would edit on the Lightworks. And Billy Pasquale Buba is here, and Billy was one of for editors and did brilliant work on the film. And how, how did all four of you work together? Well, Michael was our supervising editor for sure, you know, and he would give us all scenes to cut. And, um, and as I was watching the film, it was funny, there were certain scenes I know I cut, mm -hmm. first cut, and then uh, there were so many scenes, well, I know I worked on that, it was 20 years ago, so I know I worked on that, I know I worked on that, but I'm not sure if I first cut it or didn't, or, so it really was, like Michael said, a community, I mean, we, mm -hmm all were there, you know, literally 24 hours a day sometimes, and, you know, you get into this sort of, you know, rhythm of just working together and, you know, where one person leaves off and another begins, you're not really sure. So it really was all of us cutting everything. You know, I, I worked on all, almost every scene, and so did Pat Buba, and so did Dove, and so did Tom Rolfe. And, um, and everything Michael just talked about is sort of what carried over into the editing. It was very much about, Michael would always say to me, you know, edit, don't edit for the subtext, don't edit for the text, edit for the feeling, edit for the emotion. Mm -hmm. And the text will take care of itself, you know, and because this is, you know, separate this from a genre picture. You know, edit for what these people are going through, edit, edit for the emotion, and I think it obviously it shows. It, it feels, everything in the film feels so essential, uh, which for an almost three hour film is, is truly remarkable. 
Is there a lot of stuff that didn't make it into the, the final cut? It, it doesn't feel that way. It feels like we're seeing very precise glimpses that, that tell us a lot about the, the off-screen life. I mean, I, I think there's, isn't there one scene, I think? Yeah, Cusimano. There was, there was a fence who's mentioned early on that mm. in the scene with Al at the crime scene. Yeah. And they actually go to that fence. There may be one other scene. But not much. Not much. Yeah. And it, it's beautifully laid out. And it's really remarkable. Yeah, I mean, it's, it was, it, it, and Michael's like a scientist, you know, he tries everything from every different angle and, and you know, um, everything is so precise and so much attention to detail. And, and all those things make, and his and Dante's work, you know, make shots hold in a way that most mortals can't. You know, he, um, he, he, gets, he has a way of holding the screen with his images that is ex extraordinary. Yeah, really, really extraordinary. Without just such an unforced quality to it, I think the imagery is really, really phenomenal, as is everything about the film. I had one story that I'd like to share. Yeah. A lot of us have talked about um, the, you know, being lovingly beaten into submission by Michael <laughs> because we really did work hours. And, I, you know, it was like 20, 30 takes. I mean, it was, you know, it just became a wonderful fugue state with me and Bob just sort of doing our thing. But I remember doing this scene, um, which took, um, you know, probably about a week or at, at the airport, maybe not that long, five days. And so I'm sitting in the car for about five days and, you know, and things are happening. And it was a nighttime shoot. And at that time, I wasn't a great napper, so I would never let myself take a nap in the trailer. I was like, no, I got, you know. So I remember this one. It was like, you know, the sun was coming up. And, and, I, was, and I said to the AD, like, um, and, Bob, and I also remember when we do these night shoots and I'd go home and go to bed and Bob's like, well, I'm working out. And I was like, well, yeah, man, because you're the, you know, you're the stud muffin of the movie, you know. <laughs> so, uh, so I remember the sun was coming up and I said to the AD, well, I'm, I'm wrapped. Am I, I must be wrapped. And she said, well, I think so, you know, but just not technically. But I'm like, oh, okay, well, I'm going to take a nap. So we took a nap. Like 20 minutes later, I'd like, ding, 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 come to the set. I was like, you gotta be fucking kidding me. Like, the sun is up. And then the genius of Michael Mann is I turned the corner, and there is my car wrapped in black. And I was like, we are never fucking wrapping. We are, and then I go over, and there's Bob with a huge bear claw, like a huge donut. And he's like, yeah, it's, it's just time. You know, it's time for espresso and donuts because this shoot is never gonna stop. <laughs> So that's that's why we're all here. We are dedicated, dedicated our life. <laughs> there was there was one there was one scene was in a different movie when I was behind I was operating a, on the camera and I was just looking through the lens and I started complaining. I said, Dante, where, where's that light coming from? Turn off that damn light. <laughs> and he said, Michael, that's the sun. <laughs> 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 well, I know everybody here would, would love to take the opportunity to thank all of you for, for coming up to share your memories of it, but also for making the film. It's a wonderful piece of work. So thank you so much. Chris, thanks so much for doing this. Thank you. Great.